I'll make it in my 20 minutes. Uh, but I'll stand ready to be cuffed and walked away off if, if necessary. So uh, it's very difficult to talk about all of the different neurosurgical issues with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. So I'm going to focus primarily on craniocervical instability, uh, which I think is the most uh, disabling of all of the neurosurgical problems. And then Rebecca also asked me to touch on tethered cord syndrome. I'm going to throw a few slides in as well on atlantoaxial instability. But when I think of headache in the Ehlers-Danlos patient, I think of craniovertebral instability and Chiari malformation and atlantoaxial instability, vertebral instability, pseudotumor cerebri, occipital neuralgia, temporomandibular joint syndrome, jugular venous occlusion, and other abnormalities of jugular flow, intracranial thrombosis, hypercoagulability, and migranous TIAs, and now the whole array of neuroimmunological disorders. We're seeing pandas and neuropachets. And of course, even tethered cord syndrome causes headache. But I'm going to focus on the craniovertebral instability. And patients with intracranial instability usually have a cervicomedullary syndrome. It's manifest by headache and neck and even face pain double vision, memory loss, speech difficulties, word finding problems, dizziness, vertigo, hearing loss, tinnitus, difficulty chewing, swallowing, choking, clumsiness, tripping, unsteady gait, orthostatic intolerance, sleep apnea, numbness, paresthesias, weakness, tremors, and even urinary and GI issues. So if you have a patient with all of these problems, the only place in the, in the body where all of these things come together in a nexus is in the craniocervical junction. So exemplary of the cervicomedullary syndrome is the Chiari malformation. And we don't have a pointer, do we? I think you can see the cerebellum, oh, right. The cerebellum uh, pushing down through the skull base here, through the foramen magnum, causing pressure on the lower medulla and upper spinal cord causing this syringomyelia down here. And the treatment for Chiari malformation has traditionally been a, simply a decompression with various bells or whistles. Now, the only problem is that if you follow these patients for more than six months, about 40 to 50 percent of them fail. And this is well established in the literature. Why is that? Uh, Grab Mapstone and Oaks in their uh, study of 50 children found deformity of the brainstem. And in those children, they performed transoral odontodectomies and posterior fusions. Kay Hand found basilar impression. Menezes talked about the fulcrum effect of the odontoid pushing on the ventral brainstem. Gold talks about mechanical instability. And we also need to think about altered venous flow that Claire was talking about out of the brain and altered compliance of the nervous tissue that affects its uh, uh, deformability and the ability of blood to flow through the nervous tissue. Recently, there have been a number of papers that discuss the complex Chiari and the importance of brainstem deformity. And in particular, the clivocervical angle, also known as the clivoaxial angle, and basilar invagination. So this is the clivus here, the center of the sphenoid bone, the skull base, and this is the axis. So this is the clivoaxial angle. And this is basilar invagination. Uh, you see here the odontoid pushing up into the brainstem, and this is a cause of sudden death in patients with deforming rheumatoid arthritis. Less so since the advent of Enbrel, uh, but uh, patients with uh, basal invagination often stop breathing and, and die. Menezes uh, has talked about basal invagination as a congenital abnormality. We see it in many of the genetic diseases, like achondroplasia. 
And he talks about the importance of the clivus canal angle, which is the same as the clivus clivoaxial angle. In this patient, the clivoaxial angle is 82 degrees. And this causes pressure on the brain stem here. You see that deformity. And uh, this publication talked about intraoperative traction reduction to decrease that angle uh, and uh, decrease the deformation and pressure on the brain stem. And Goal, who has a very large series in India, talks about the importance of microtrauma from the odontoid pressing on the brain stem. And these repeated microcord injuries, uh, which he believes are the defining factor in the entire pathophysiology that surround basal invagination. And he cites as contributory causes uh, of, of this problem, malnutrition, forceps delivery, vitamin deficiencies, degenerative changes. And that seems to be an excellent segue to Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, where we have a lot of degenerative changes in the discs and the osteo and the ligaments and bones. We see poor muscular conditioning. We see vitamin deficiencies in the majority of EDS patients. And these loose ligaments and weak muscles cause a floppy head syndrome. The head is sliding backwards and forwards over the spine. And this is causes stretching and deformation of the brainstem, the upper spinal cord, the lower cranial nerves, the vertebral arteries, and of course on all of the ligaments. And this causes a chronic microtrauma to the brainstem and upper spinal cord. So the gold stem, oh, well, let's go on here. Let me talk a little bit about the neurobiology of deformative stress, i.e., this this micro trauma, what is it actually doing to the central nervous system? At an engineering level, uh, stretching, uh, when, when we simply flex the neck, bend the head forward, we cause our spinal cord and brain stem to stretch. In fact, if you measure the length of the cord between neutral on the left and flexion seen there on the right, there's a stretching or lengthening of the spinal cord of 17%, which uh, comes precariously close to the 20% stretch at which the squid axon loses its function. And uh, Professor Brieg, uh, who did a lot of this thinking and work back in the 70s and early 80s, showed that this stretching of the spinal cord and brainstem is greatly increased by the presence of out-of-plane loading, such as from a disc or a retroflexed odontoid. Any pressure on the front, say, of the spinal cord here, pushing in, increases the tensile loading or the stretching of the cord, and also causes changes opposite the side of compression. And so, then what is the pathological substrate, the histological substrate of what I'm talking about? And when I was doing my fellowship in London, England, uh, at National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery, the professor asked me to look at the spinal cord and brainstem of 10 patients who had died sudden deaths as a result of brainstem compression from the odontoid. And he's, he said, what you'll find is ischemic change and necrosis, write it up, and, and then give me a paper in two weeks and we'll move on. And, but when we looked at the histology, we found these small uh, silver staining uh, balls that we later recognized as axon retraction balls. And that these, in fact, were not the result of ischemia, but were the result of, of stretching, deformity, deformative stress. And uh, we published this work, but. It was a little before its time, but a few years later, Pablo Schock and Maxwell Jafari published their seminal work on what happens when you stretch neurons. And this is very pertinent in the brain when you're thinking of diffuse axonal injury, but stretching neurons causes clumping uh, and loss of the neurofilaments, which are the internal architecture of nerves, and of the microtubules, which are the highways for fast axonal transport. And you can see here 
Here's a normal nerve up here, and then after stretching, there's clumping of these constituents. And if you take a mouse optic nerve and stretch it 20% of its length, you'll see that in three days, these axon balls show up, and at 10 days, uh, there's uh, a lot of nerve destruction and apoptosis and loss of, uh, of nerves. Wolf showed that if you stretch a nerve, you deform the, cal uh, the sodium channels, and this causes uh, depolarization of the calcium channels and causes a massive influx of calcium, which is shown on the top here as, as the yellow color, the massive influx of calcium. And this influx is blocked by blocking the sodium channels with tetrodotoxin. And then Arendine showed that stretching is actually an epigenetic phenomenon to nerves. If you stretch a nerve, you cause upregulation of N-methyl D-aspartate receptors. And we were talking about nitrous oxide over dinner. And uh, these NMDA receptors are very important in learning and also in seizures, but they increase the vulnerability of the nerve to various nitrous oxide and free radical oxygen species. And they cause uh, mitochondrial dysfunction, DNA fragmentation, and even apoptosis. And in this clinical study, we showed that uh, in these patients with sleep apnea and who had this uh, basilar invagination, you see right here, uh, we performed transoral odontidectomy and removed the compression of the brainstem and the sleep apnea went away. And we published that work uh, in 1994. And then all of these concepts uh, uh, we put together in May of 2005. I rewrote this paper 10 times. Um, it was finally accepted, but it's, it's, uh, I think it's becoming well established now that the importance of deformation and stretch in the spinal cord. Um, so then mechanical forces modulate gene expression and biochemical composition and directly affect neurons, making them more sensitive and more vulnerable to injury. So then we've been talking about floppy head syndrome. How do we measure uh, craniocervical instability? How do we predict it? The two surrogate measures of basilar invagination uh, that we can use in the Ehlers-Danlos population. And one is the cliboaxial angle that I've discussed. Another is the grab oaks measurement that I will discuss. So here's the normal cliboaxial angle between the skull base and the spine. It's 165 degrees. And if you get a protractor, you all can do this. You all is a southern term that means you all. Okay. <laughs> Uh, inflection, um, the, the cliboaxial angle decreases to 155 degrees. On extension of the neck, it increases to 175 degrees. That's normal. Now, I think all of you would agree that this is abnormal, this cliboaxial angle. This is a patient I did uh, not so long ago. And this angulation causes uh, a deformity of the brainstem. And you can, you can see how it would cause a stretching of the fibers in the back of the brainstem. You don't have to be an engineer or a neurosurgeon to see uh, on the left with a gentle bend of the brainstem, there's no stretching. But when you get a cliboaxial angle around 120 degrees, that, the, that there is a considerable stretch introduced into the brainstem. And this, we believe, causes many of the symptoms and findings in the EDS population. So the cliboaxial angle then is a surrogate measure of basal invagination. And uh, Kim, Rekate, Klopfenstein, and Sontag looked at uh, a number of patients with carry malformation and found 10 that had failed. And in each of those 10, the cliboaxial angle was less than 135 degrees. That's uh, that angle right there. And when they performed an intraoperative reduction of that angle and then a posterior fusion, uh, all of the patients, or 90% of the patients, improved. And Kubota in, in, uh, in uh, Japan showed that a 
Chiari decompression failed to improve the syringomyelia, which commonly accompanies Chiari's. In all of those cases where the uh, cliboaxial angle was less than 130 degrees. So there's something very important about the cliboaxial angle, and all of these authors have noted that importance, um, uh, often using slightly different terms. And uh, we published a paper on the deformative stress associated with abnormal cliboaxial angle and compared it with finite element analyses that was published in 2010. Now another way to look at ventral, at, at this deformation and basal uh, invagination is to look at the grab Oaks line. And that's simply a line drawn from the basion to the posterior inferior aspect of C2 and then draw a perpendicular measurement. If that is uh, nine millimeters or more, then you have ventral brainstem compression. So every time that person bends his head down to look at his cell phone or computer, they're causing a micro trauma on the brainstem. Now, there's some other important measurements. Holly looked at 600 normal spine x-rays and said that the distance between the basion here and the odontoid uh, should be usually about five millimeters. If that distance is more than 10 millimeters, then you've got instability. So that's that measurement there in green. It should be less than 10 millimeters. And Lee just did a line from the basion, that yellow line, to the midpoint of the C2 lamina, and the odontoid process should lay in front of that line. If the odontoid transgresses that line, you have instability. Now, the Harris measurement is, measurement is particularly important. That's from the basion to this posterior axial line, and that measurement should be less than 12 millimeters or you have instability. But using this measurement allows us also to see if there's any translation between the skull and the spine. And so this is the Harris measurement then. One is between the basion and this posterior axial line, and another is between the basion and the odontoid. Now, so in the normal condition, sorry, in the normal condition, uh, in flexion and extension, and we do a lot of dynamic flexion extension MRIs. If you don't have one here, you need to get one. Uh, the odontoid process should lie right underneath the tip of the basion there. And, and that, that should pivot over the same point without moving backwards and forwards. And the evidence for that is, is uh, legion. There are many authors who describe and who state that there is no horizontal translation between the skull and the spine. The skull should not be sliding back and forth on the spine, it should pivot. And the reason for that should be obvious. Any sliding is gonna cause stretching of all the components. So here's a pathological stretch between flexion and extension. The skull is sliding backwards and forwards, in this case, five millimeters. All right, there's one other measurement uh, that I, won't go into in detail, and that's the, um, the amount of rotation between the first two vertebrae. If uh, normally when you turn your head to the side, all that rotation occurs at the level of C1 for the first 20 degrees, and for the next 20 degrees, C1 and C2 move together, and, and so when you turn your neck all the way to the right, say, C1 should rotate no more than about 35 degrees on C2. But if the first cervical vertebra, C1, rotates more than 40 degrees, you're starting to get into a danger area. Our threshold is about 44 degrees. At that point, the vertebral artery becomes kinked and the blood flow through it uh, becomes drastically diminished and you start getting retrograde flow from the carotid circulation. And you can get all kinds of, um, you know, uh, uh, posterior. That's not a comment on what I'm saying. Uh, you can get all kinds of um, uh, neurological problems from that. Will you take
take this off my 20 minutes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, now in the EDS population, we're measuring C12 rotation in every patient. In this patient, you can see there's uh, a significant rotation such that the facet joints are almost dislocated. If, if someone just turned this person's head another five degrees, those two uh, vertebrae would become dislocated and there'd be a significant risk of death. So now I'm just gonna uh, quickly present some preliminary results on 22 patients with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome who underwent craniospinal fusion. These were consecutive patients undergoing fusion. Uh, they weren't selected and, uh, in 2011-2012. And so we identified 24 patients, 22 responded uh, and filled out all the paperwork and whatnot. And uh, all the, uh, these results were taken by a third party. It wasn't me asking the questions. Um, it was a uh, researcher that, that they had not met. The 21 females, uh, it, because it's usually women who present with the uh, craniocervical instability. Now these are all the symptoms that we saw in this patient and you question the number of different systems involved and here uh, there are headaches, fatigue, dizziness, muscle pain, weakness of the arms, joint pain, neck pain, balance problems. This is descending order of occurrence. Memory, night awakenings, um, numbness, walking problems, dysautonomic, uh, hands and feet turning cold, leg numbness, visual problems, leg weakness, vertigo, hearing issues, speech, uh, urinary frequency, GERD, swallowing, choking problems, nocturia, irritable bowel syndrome, tremors, uh, some of these tremors can get quite significant uh, and look like seizures. Numbness in the back, sleep apnea, a lot of symptoms. And our indications for surgery were a headache, significant headache or neck pain, you know, six or seven, uh, well, average seven actually. Brainstem and spinal cord symptoms, uh, obvious neurological deficits, and then radiological demonstration of ventral brainstem compression or basilar invagination. And the, so the patients are position prone. Uh, the head is in a head holder and they're prepped and draped. We don't have to shave terribly much. Uh, this is actually a cadaver uh, uh, performing a suboccipital decompression uh, on the left and on the right. I'm uh, drilling uh, the spine, drilling holes in the spine to place screws. This is a little bit uh, difficult because the screws have to lie within one millimeter of the vertebral artery. The bones tend to be very small and the screw positioning has to be absolutely precise to avoid the vertebral artery. Uh, we have a CT scanner in the, in the room and so after I place the screws, I check it with a CT to make sure everything's perfect and we've not had any vertebral artery injuries. Then I walk to the head of the table and perform an open reduction and this is uh, described by many authors, but basically I take the head in the head holder and perform a traction maneuver and then a extension maneuver and a posterior translation to bring the basion, the skull base, directly over the center of the odontoid. This is usually an iterative process. Uh, we take a lot of measurements and we try to maximize all of the various uh, angles and uh, the optimal positions. And then, uh, as you commented, we, we place these grotesque screws into the back of the head and, and spine in order to stabilize that relationship. And to make that permanent, we take bone from the rib cage and place it between the skull and the spine. Uh, after usually three or four months, uh, the fusion is uh, fairly complete and the metal hardware becomes redundant. Uh, our fusion rate's been about 99%. And here's the uh, instrumentation. And then you can see the uh, split ribs here on either side of the spine between the skull base, C1 and C2. And here's the wound. Um, 
uh, one week after surgery, one month after surgery. And here's a young lady, uh, a month after, she allowed me to use these pictures, a month after surgery, showing that she actually has fairly good range of motion despite the fact that we fused the skull to C2. Here's an illustrative case, 16-year-old girl, um, headaches, 50% truancy, progressive clumsiness, poor balance. She said, I know what to do, I just can't tell my body what to do. She had jerking motions in the legs. Her teachers really disliked her because they thought she was a behavior problem. She had weakness, spasticity, uh, disordered sleep architecture. Of course, her studies were read as normal, but I think you all now, all of you all, can look here and does this, you see how this odontoid is well behind the clivus, and I think you can see that that is not normal. And the cliboaxial angle was abnormal. So she was, had diffusion stabilization, is postoperative MRI. After surgery, her pain level went from 55 to 100, but the large number of brainstem symptoms that she had uh, w their 11 symptoms went to zero. Her Konofsky, you know, functional index, performance scale index went to 100. Her quality of life index, the SF36, uh, went to above normal. She began cycling 14 miles every day. Her reading speed doubled. She's captain of the debating team. Straight A's went to college. Now, in this 20 ser series of uh, 24 patients, I said we got um, 22 patients uh, participating. We said, looking back, would you still have that craniovertebral fusion surgery? And 68% uh, strongly agreed, 25% uh, agreed, 9% somewhat agreed, no one disagreed. Uh, would you recommend that to a family member? And I think there's one patient that somewhat disagreed. My quality of life was improved by having the craniovertebral fusion surgery, and uh, uh, all of the patients agreed to some extent. Uh, having this improved my symptoms, decreased my limitations. Again, uh, uh, there was a, a agreement that there was uh, improvement. Now, if we look at symptom by symptom, and I actually deleted many slides that looked into this in more detail, we saw improvement in vertigo um, uh, Ninety-two percent of patients with vertigo improved. Eighty-two percent of patients with headaches balanced. Seventy-eight percent um, numbness. Seventy-six percent dizziness. All the symptoms in blue uh, significantly improved, and the uh, the latter symptoms, uh, which may have more to do with uh, the other aspects of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Uh, uh, did not significantly improve. These, uh, we, we took this information at two years, and so in the course of the two years, uh, there are many other things going on with those patients. Uh, but uh, if you wanted to know what, statistic, what, what symptoms showed statistically uh, significant improvement, it was the frequency and, and uh, and grade of the headache, neck pain, the dizziness, vertigo, walking problems, and balance problems. Uh, the headache uh, improved p-value of 0.001. And uh, you'll notice, by the way, that the headache does not go away completely. Red is before surgery, blue is after surgery. And we see an improvement in the headaches, but, but it's, they haven't gone away completely. There's still more issues. Frequency of headaches uh, decreased p-value of 0.001. Average neck pain decreased to p-value of 0.005. And again, you see in red the neck pain before 7 to 10. Afterwards, there's still neck pain, uh, but it's not as bad. Uh, we looked at the Konofsky performance status scale, which uh, Dr. Frank Amano discussed. 100 is normal. and uh, 10 is you, you, you are dying, and uh, 80 is you're able to go to work. And so uh, of a group of 22, 14 improved uh, at least one grade, five at two years showed no change, three showed uh, worsening, 
And overall, the group improved from a Konofsky uh, scale of 59 to 75. Uh, there, were no, uh, there were no perioperative complications, but rib pain was present in almost every patient. Uh, 95, 71% uh, reported persistent rib pain after surgery, but the pain was usually fairly mild, a three, and patients uh, were not too bothered by that. But we have altered our rib harvest technique to uh, mitigate that. So concluding on this part, the kyphotic clavoaxial angle of 135 degrees and craniocervical instability with or without Chiari malformation result in a panoply of neurological findings and reduction of the kyphotic clavoaxial angle and occiput to C12 stabilization and fusion appear to benefit the patient and headache, neck pain, dizziness, balance and gait are statistically significantly improved. A lot of the other symptoms are improved but not, not with statistical significance. Now I'm just very briefly going to talk about atlantoaxial instability and I showed you this picture where C1 was about to dislocate off C2. And these patients have a very characteristic presentation of neck pain and headache, nausea, orthostatic intolerance, dysautonomia, pain with neck turning, pain over the C1-2. If you press them back here, they, they will, it'll be painful and cause nausea. Uh, there's decreased pinprick sensation. Hyper, they're typically hyperreflexic. They have uh, dystidocokinesia. Uh, they improve with a neck brace and a CT confirmation. The surgery, uh, this is how I uh, uh, correct that. It's been a very successful surgery. And um, I, I love this diagnosis because it's, um, it's much less surgery for the patient. Uh, I've had some patients go home from hospital after, one day after surgery, and uh, we've not had any issues with this. Tethered cord syndrome seems to go along with craniovertebral instability. And the many types of tethering, I'm just going to mention briefly the type we see with EDS. It's a stretching of the spinal cord by the phylum terminal. And it's uh, in the EDS population, it's a clinical diagnosis, not a radiological one, because you often don't see any significant radiological features. But the patients, especially the children, have weakness of the legs that's otherwise unexplained, low back pain, sensory loss, especially in the sacral dermatomes, and a neurogenic bladder confirmed by <coughs> urodynamics. And we're looking for a large post void residual detrusive sphincter dysenergia characteristic findings. And there's remote history of frequent UTIs, of bedwetting, toe walking as a child, or they may have been pigeon toed, growing pains, leg cramps, sleeping with knees bent flat feet, um, and, um, and keep in mind the tethered cord syndrome can cause paresthesias of the hands and also headaches. And of course, you have to rule out other causes of uh, peripheral neuropathy. Now, I said that most cases of tethered cord and EDS don't have radiological findings, but they might have a fatty phylum terminal, fat in the phylum, or they may have a spina bifida occulta, loss of absent uh, bone over S1, or they may have a, a terminal syringomyelia or a scoliosis. There are other uh, features of tethered cord syndrome. And here's this big band here is the phylum. Uh, and uh, it's usually, normally in the normal patient, it's about half a millimeter in size. In an EDS with tethered cord syndrome, it's usually one to two and a half millimeters. And when you cut that, it, it briskly retracts and we've seen an excellent response in the patients. So we've not done a formal study. This is just an informal telephone um, survey from some research helpers. But um, we saw a neurological improvement in 11 out of 13 patients, functional improvement in 10 out of 13, quality of life uh, eight out of 13, and improvement in pain in 11 out of 13. Uh, this, this one doesn't seem to make sense given that the pain was better, but there you have it. So every patient, with the exception of one, said they'd do the surgery again if they had the choice, would recommend it to a family member. 
the complications were really minimal, like an IV thrombosis, a urethritis, small PE. Over the last four years, I've had two pseudomeningocele, one of which uh, required me taking the patient back to surgery for a, a, a relatively small procedure. It's been a very safe procedure with no significant morbidity. So in conclusion, tethered cord syndrome is the result of tension of the far limb terminal and stretching of the spinal cord. And in EDS, it's a clinical diagnosis, not a radiological one. In a well-selected patient, uh, we see improvement. Uh, uh, the published improvement is 85%. Uh, amongst my patients, it's been more like better than 90%. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, all the many people I've uh, been working with, especially Dr. Frank Amano, uh, who I think is uh, one of the um, uh, anyone who knows her knows uh, they, um, she is, um, uh, she's done so much for Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and she's so kind to every patient and their families and works tirelessly to help them. But um, everyone on this page has done a tremendous uh, work um, toward this effort. Thank you for your attention. All right. Did, did I uh, go over my 20 minutes? I One of the things I've learned is once you let a surgeon start, <laughs> I'm, you're there till the end. <laughs> Doesn't matter how much I make the patient move midway through. No, oh, thanks very much, Dr. Anderson. Okay. Any questions, please? Can you ask? Actually, um, I, I've, I, my fellowship was in craniocervical. I've been doing this procedure a lot for over 20 years. And the, uh, I think it's one of the best surgeries uh, that I do in terms of the benefit to the patient. Uh, and, and the relative lack of morbidity. Uh, it, it's, it's potentially a very dangerous procedure, but then so is driving on the beltway. And so if you know the if you know the risks and you and you're diligent and careful, I mean if you like your patient, then it seems to be uh, relatively free from morbidity and high um, you know, very rewarding from my point of view. So of the patients that come to you, how many fill fulfill the criteria for surgical procedure? Like I, I, I just want to get a sense of because a, a lot of the symptoms uh, seem to be what we discussed as the presenting symptoms. So, do you think yeah. that all patients? Well, no, I think uh, I, I see patients from all over the United States, and South America, and Europe, and Kazakhstan, I mean, everyone. So, uh, I think I'm getting the worst patients. And uh, if, but if someone walks in and they're still at work, if they're able to work and function, reasonably normally, then I don't think they're a good candidate for surgery. I, I, um, I think that actually they, they might well benefit from surgery, but I'm getting a little bit more conservative, uh, um, but getting back to your question, the, uh, I, I, would, I would guess that uh, you know, maybe one in a hundred EDS patients needs this kind of surgery. But I, I don't know, we'd, we'd have to round up a, a lot of EDS patients and test them all. And I, I think that only the worst patients get diagnosed. And um, so m my practice is very unusual. Most of my patients are out of state. And from around Washington locally, uh, I mean, that constitutes maybe 10% of my practice. Uh, but if people who actually come to me, I think I, I'll operate on uh, 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 the probably, well, you know, I haven't really added it up. But uh, most of the patients who are sent to me are, are pretty severe to begin with. Anyway, yeah. I hope that answers your question. Yes. Yeah. There, there, there. Okay, yes.
Are you doing the tendon cord surgery and the cranial cervical stability test? Which one do you do first? Well, I operate on the principle that if you if you do the worst one, the worst problem first, then see how they do. If they can function well enough with that, then, then that's all that they really need. I, I mean, I'd, I'd rather do just one surgery and then and that's it. Now, the reality is that um, a lot of the patients who've had the craniocervical surgery did need a tethered cord surgery. And um, and I don't, I don't really know why. Uh, and uh, and which one do I do first? Again, I, I do the the problem that's that's most you know severe at the time. Some people can barely walk or can't walk, and so I'll do the tethered cord first. But if if they are having excruciating headaches and orthostatic intolerance and syncopal episodes and hand numbness and weakness, then I'll do the craniocervical stabilization first. Do you notice any association between EDS and cervical myelinator? Or with the patients with EDS, do you notice any family members also visit incidents of cervical myelinator? The last part is, if a patient has a cervical myelinator, if a patient with classic EDS, uh, will you consider the surgery to correct um, well, first, um, uh, Ehlers Danlos, of course, is autosomal dominant, and Chiari is very familial. So we often see Chiaris in many members of the family. Uh, we don't see as many cases with syringomyelia. Uh, uh, I used to do more surgeries on syringomyelia about 10 years ago. Uh, but now uh, I think that syringomyelia generally reflects uh, a pathological process somewhere else. So if you have a Chiari in an abnormal clavoaxial angle, if you fix the Chiari in the clavoaxial angle, the syrinx will go away. And so that's how I handle most syrinxes. Or the syrinx may be from a tethered cord. If you have a syrinx in the lower thoracic spine, then look for a tethered cord syndrome. And fixing that will take the syrinx away. So to me, a syrinx is a marker for another pathological process. Dysautonomia is multifaceted. You mentioned orthostatic intolerance and syncope. And there's also uh, imbalance of the synthetics and parasynthetics. And sometimes they talk about you know, sweating, hypohydrosis, and, and then chills and sweats. And, and I think that's you know, dysautonomia. And then the Renaud's phenomenon. And you're right, uh, it would be, uh, we probably could establish a um, some metrics for dysautonomia and, and measure it. That would be a very good thing to do. But uh, we have not been doing that. What is the simple thing that you use is the right? So which is a marker of uh, cardiovascular dysfunction, right? So and we use the ultra monitor, right? So basically the ultra monitor before and after the surgery, right? So we can look at this imbalance, autonomic imbalance from the, the some analysis that we use with our respect analysis. To put on a halter mummy. Yeah, before and after the. Yes. Yeah. 